Well, we'll come to the last paper of this session. The papers by Dr. Miley, Progress in Cluster Enabled LENR. Dr. Miley, as you all know, has been at the University of Illinois for many years, and he has been in the field for almost 30 years. So, George. Right side takes you forward, and oh, okay. left one takes you backward. Okay, right. hoping it stays there. You want to go to the left? Yeah, okay. Right side. Good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, by myself and the uh, uh, Industrial Heat uh, Laboratory in uh, Champaign-Urbana, uh, the group that they are supporting there. Again, as in the previous uh, first talk, Today, uh, we want to thank them for their very generous support and encouragement. Uh, so, uh, outline, I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but let me say this. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, understand a reproducible way of producing uh, particles that will produce excess heat and, of course, nuclear reactions in the process. And uh, the way we're viewing that is that the basic concept involves creating defects in the material and in the process uh, loading these defects with uh, gas such that you get a sort of Bose-Einstein condensate into the defect and that uh, this creates a very dense state which is a nuclear reaction site that produces the heat and reactions. So uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of work along those lines, so let me proceed ahead. Uh, now, uh, I'm, I have a lot of slides and going through this fairly fast. Uh, we have posters that go into more details, and uh, the other members of the team are uh, manning these posters and uh, can uh, fill you in if you have a chance to get by there. I think it's very good. Here's, here's our uh, industrial heat uh, lab team in Champaign, uh, and there are five of us from this team here. So uh, the concept of the defect forming uh, clusters uh, originates from electrolytic work we did with thin films. And uh, as shown here, we have a thin film, which, uh, let's see if one of these things is a, hmm. we, oh, okay, trying to find a, Okay, so, so uh, down here at the bottom, uh, we produce the thin film, oxidize the surfaces, uh, did electrolytic uh, uh, runs with that, and uh, as shown in the next slide, if you uh, do a uh, temperature controlled uh, uh, gas pressure uh, release from these, if you simply put the thin film electrode in as I shown, as I showed, did nothing to it uh, before you did the run, and uh, then pulled it out and uh, measured the gas release as a function of temperature, uh, you'd get a line something like this. Uh, however, if uh, you uh, load and deload it many times and then do this, uh, you'll find that you get this uh, peak release at higher temperature, which is attributed to the fact that uh, in the uh, 
loading, deloading, what you're doing is creating many defects, which are where the, uh, these uh, dense clusters are formed. And uh, those, in turn, then give this release from the, the uh, bound cluster at uh, uh, the higher temperatures. And uh, we also did these uh, measurements with a, uh, a squid device, which showed that the, uh, these clusters were essentially uh, 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 superconducting at uh, uh, around 70 degrees K. And uh, I've shown those in previous talks. Uh, what we wanted to do then is move ahead to uh, move ahead to uh, uh, nanoparticles and gas loading so that, uh, that we felt that, that would be a more convenient way of uh, having commercial devices. So uh, today what we're talking about is actually uh, the nanoparticles. Now the, the trick here is to figure out how to uh, prepare the nanoparticles so that they have uh, increased defects so that you can get a high density of these clusters within the nanoparticles. And uh, that's a different ball game from this loading, deloading we were talking about. And much of it goes back to the manufacture of the nanoparticles. Uh, so uh, we have studied uh, in some experiments that I'm showing you here, uh, two different types of nanoparticles. They're both of the uh, same composition roughly with uh, uh, palladium uh, and uh, zirconia. And the concept of that composition comes from, uh, well, what we had before, where we had palladium, palladium oxide. Here, we're using zirconium, which turns out to be a, a, a separate phase that uh, condenses out into palladium when we manufacture it such that uh, uh, it can anchor the formation of the defects, which then, in turn, are where the clusters form. And so uh, that's the reason for a selection of that type of composition. Now, uh, we have what we call a legacy type, which were uh, first uh, the, the, the alloy composition was, was uh, created in this high temperature furnace. This in turn then was milled in just a standard ball milling machine at room temperature. And uh, that would be what we call the legacy particles. Now our uh, NT new particles, so to speak, uh, have been produced somewhat differently. We, we uh, uh, have a uh, arc uh, uh, furnace um, to produce the alloy, and then we have a cryogenic mill that uh, we do the milling in, which doing that at low temperature again emphasizes or uh, uh, produces more defects per cubic centimeter, we hope. <laughs> and uh, so we're looking at that. Uh, some of the uh, comparison, uh, I'll show you some for uh, palladium spheres which were not uh, ball milled at all. I'll show you some palladium that has no zirconia uh, that has been ball milled using the same process of cryo milling, milling as a comparison. Uh, the thought is that if we haven't uh, used our milling process, we probably shouldn't have produced sufficient defects to have much uh, reaction occurring. So uh, moving ahead, oops, am I going backwards? I guess I am, sorry about that. Uh, just a couple pictures of the, uh, the stuff uh, that we've taken to give you a uh, concept. It's something like a one and a half uh, micrometer uh, size uh, particles. And if you look at them uh, uh, before uh, milled, but uh, cryo milled but not uh, oxidized. You get what, what you see in the left on the right is uh, uh, oxidized particles. Uh, it's hard to really uh, 
correlate and make sure that we, what I had said, that we are producing more uh, defects, more clusters uh, with uh, our type of milling process. Uh, one thing that we are doing is uh, NMR experiments using uh, one of the labs at the University of Illinois to see if we can uh, get a uh, better insight into that. And uh, here you'll notice that the uh, Finding the thing on here. Anyway, you'll notice uh, two different uh, uh, formations of hydrogen when we've done that in some experiments, indicating that we have hydrogen bound in two energy states, which uh, can come from two different types of uh, defects and hence two different cluster sizes being uh, created in the process. Uh, that's ongoing work. What we have done a good bit on is using a uh, uh, pressure depressurization calorimeter. Uh, the, uh, the calorimeter has inside it this uh, vessel that uh, contains the uh, this thing. vessel there that contains the uh, nanoparticles and then a vacuum chamber uh, and the outside wall uh, as a um, heat transfer media. And uh, we have uh, thermocouples in the outside wall, thermocouples here. We're measuring the heat losses uh, between the two, which is dominated by radiation from inside to outside, but some conduction through the filling lines. And we take that into account with the calculation also with thermocouples long nose. So a typical run with this, <clears throat> what we've been doing is we first uh, pressurize and you get a rapid increase in temperature and then a, a decrease. Then we, uh, once it comes back to uh, around room temperature, we uh, draw a vacuum depressurize, and there you get a cooling effect as the uh, either hydrogen or deuterium in, in the particles uh, is coming out, and it comes, takes a longer time to come back to the beginning temperature. So this is a typical cycle, and uh, we are doing this this way because if we take the differences between this and this, we can determine if there's an excess heat being produced, and uh, that uh, uh, uses the same vessel, so the calorimetry is, uh, uh, errors in the calorimetry tend to cancel out between the, between the two, and that helps us in terms of, oops, helps us in terms of uh, uh, accuracy. So, uh, the analysis is to take uh, using thermocouples and radiative and conductive heat tra transfer calculations is to take the difference between those two. And uh, the, the difference probably best shown in this graph is uh, then what we're attributing to the uh, net excess energy coming out due to the LENR reaction. So if you, uh, if you look at this, here's the graph I showed earlier, conceptually heating, cooling. If you take the energy under this curve and conceptually put it back over here, if there is an additional value, that would be an excess because it, for a reversible process, uh, the energy produced uh, due to the chemical portion of the loading would be balanced by the cooling energy in during the deloading. Uh, in practice, it's harder to uh, extract or deload so that in practice, actually, you'll find that if you take the difference between the two and there were no excess due to reactions, it was all chemical, 
you would uh, get a negative value for a difference. In other words, this, you wouldn't get a red curve, you'd get a negative value. And we'll see that later. So uh, I'm going to show a lot of data. We've look, done a number of experiments over six months. We've been varying in a lot of things, so uh, a lot of the data has some scatter in it. But uh, what we notice is that we've always gotten a uh, excess net energy out, uh, but there's big scatter in it. We then, that's because we've been changing a lot of things for the most part. We then made some runs where we didn't change things trying to show uh, a uh, consistent reproducibility and show you that. So uh, our, uh, we, we use zirconia without any palladium and so on as a baseline run to, to uh, uh, test our calorimetry and uh, so there shouldn't be any excess there. Uh, we used uh, palladium microspheres which were not milled, which were not treated, which we didn't expect to have um, many defects and so on. Uh, so that uh, uh, when we did run to fit, uh, we actually got uh, these negative values for the net energy out, as I just indicated we should get. And uh, now when we did other runs, though, if you focus mainly in the left graph here, uh, <clears throat> we, we did these with the palladium that was milled. Uh, same way, and we expect some reactions occurring there. Uh, the legacy particles and the, the new particles, and they're shown in a hist histogram. Uh, so what we have there is the amount of excess joules produced in these runs and the number of runs that produce that amount. And you'll see a lot of the uh, cryo mill type of particles uh, were in this range here. One outlier, uh, as expected, we got a little bit of excess from the uh, palladium, and uh, uh, the legacy particles are more down there someplace. And if we look at it in terms of the, uh, of the uh, percent produced, Excess, percent of excess uh, versus numbers of uh, runs. They get grouped into this range here, and we get some outline in that range. Uh, and uh, I think I, I, let me pass by that. Uh, in trying to uh, sort those out in terms of variations that were being made during those runs, uh, which uh, Cause some difference is uh, if we uh, if we try to uh, correlate the excess versus the mass, you you see that there's a reasonable correlation. There's virtually a straight line going up here for that uh, versus pressure. Uh, there's a lot more variation. In, in quite it's clear what's happening. Looks like there's a increase in ex excess of increase of pressure up to 50. PSG, but if we uh, if we go above that, it looks like if anything it comes back down again. Some or maybe there's a line here and maybe one across that way. I don't know. Uh, we have to investigate that a lot. But the nice thing is we don't have to go to uh, excessively high pressures. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, there were substantial variations in those results due to those changes of the type I just showed. Uh, if, we, uh, if we go on to uh, uh, reproducibility runs, we, we ran somewhere we expected to always get the same results by keeping everything constant. And uh, here we had something like that. This would be the, the, the run number. And we should have gotten a straight line here. So we have variations like so for always the same amount, same pressure, same temperature runs, and so on. 
And uh, it's interesting you put those back into the uh, previous graph that we showed, and you see the blue ones are the reproducibility ones, which sort of lay in the center of all the scatter we had from the previous run for things were being varied. Uh, so uh, what we, we've looked at a lot of different things. Uh, one of the obvious worries is whether or not uh, 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 oxidation reactions are occurring to give false signals and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, I reference you to go to this poster that's uh, by Jake Meyer and uh, the pond that uh, is going to uh, be presenting that for him. Uh, the uh, 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 in, in the most cases, what we always have done is uh, eliminate the, f the data from the first run when we put new particles in, and uh, the first run usually gives a, a, a much larger excess heat due to some uh, oxidation reduction that's still taking place. But in our experience, uh, after the first run, uh, when we, if we've started with new particles or we open up the vessel exposed to air and start over again, if you eliminate the first run, you're usually okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I think we can summarize most of that by saying uh, it's uh, uh, within the data we have taken from that, uh, it uh, seems conclusive to us at least thus far that uh, there is an important LENR effect taking place. Uh, since we worry some about this calorimetry and issues there, uh, an additional experiment we did was a water bath experiment. And uh, the water bath experiments was very simple. Uh, we simply put a pressure vessel inside a tube of water and uh, the temperature of the water should increase to some value above the room temperature if there is a net power out uh, as you oscillate between pressurization and depressurization. So as it's going up and down, uh, there, there should be a net heating of the water. And uh, if there's any heating of the water, that shows that we're getting a net output. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, the size of the vessel we could put in, the amount of powder we can put in and so on uh, here, uh, we're limited by just the equipment we had quickly available. So this thing was uh, maybe not as uh, impressive as you like, but it shows what we wanted to show. Uh, what uh, This is a calibration of calorized heater in it. And we can see that with uh, uh, 0.05 watts input, we get a temperature increase of about a degree C. Uh, so it's reasonably, we try to keep the amount of water fairly low so that uh, it's reasonably sen sensible, uh, sensitive. Uh, so uh, a uh, run that uh, illustrates that we did succeed in this, this is a five hour run. In the, and, and you, we start here, and you can see the pressurization, depressurization, many of them, timing being that uh, it was pressurized every two minutes for 30 seconds and depressurized uh, uh, for 90 seconds. And this big gap in the center was uh, where we depressurized over a long, much longer period just to restart again you see. And you can see we leveled out until we finally depressurized here toward the end. So there's, there's a very uh, distinct uh, heating. And this is a run that was uh, made over uh, an extended period of time. And you can see uh, produced uh, uh, around uh, 4.6 uh, kilojoules. 
and in summary, it runs in this water bath uh, over a number of days. Uh, so uh, we ended up with around uh, 16 kilojoules produced in the water bath over these various uh, runs. So uh, trying to further look into the uh, uh, use of this for demonstration that it was a uh, nuclear reaction. We were looking for reaction products and uh, wanted to uh, consider changes in the metal, uh, which we can measure SIMS and so on, or in the gas, RTG, uh, 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 or with uh, CR39 type of things. Uh, I want uh, the, uh, I think it's Simplified with the present equipment we have, we weren't able to uh, to measure uh, changes in the gas composition. Uh, we need to do more work on that. Likewise, unfortunately, due to contamination that's produced both in the uh, well in the milling and and, and the run process, uh, uh, we have great difficulty in measuring accurately the changes in the isotopic composition. I don't know one, the, the only thing that uh, seemed to be happening uh, in the first one that was above the noise level. I think a lot's happening below the noise level with changing in uh, some of the silver uh, uh, isotopes. So we need to do a lot more work in that. I think what's, uh, uh, most evident at the moment is CR39. We've uh, worked hard on that. Uh, with the CR39, we tried to concentrate on a process where uh, we are able to uh, examine a whole uh, a slice of the CR39 in a consistent manner uh, based on uh, uh, training uh, using a uh, uh, reference like, uh, for example, starting here with uh, uh, uranium-235, uh, uh, uranium-238 uh, uh, images, train our uh, microscope and, and uh, uh, software system so it can recognize such tracks and go from frame to frame and doing it. And uh, so uh, we have two things here. First, uh, this thing is running here, but uh, first the uh, trick is to get the CR39 into the vessel with the, uh, with the nanoparticles and also uh, have it such that we know where the CR39 is in the vessel and cover a range along the radius of the particles in the vessel. So on the left is a special one that we built, special vessel, uh, pressure vessel, and we put a cup in, it has slots in it, and see, these slots hold the slices of CR39 that we put in here, that are sitting vertically, looking, we were looking down the top of the vessel there. And then if we run through that in the system that I showed you, uh, for example, on the right-hand side, here's the background. This is sort of a three-dimensional view that's, that, that gives the uh, number of a given type of track that's found in, per unit area in a given region of the, of, of the CR39. So we, we have, uh, this going along the uh, CR39 is stuck down in there, and uh, we have uh, this this region here is where that top is, and this is down at the bottom. Anyway, uh, when we've done three pressure cycles, six, and then go up to nine and twelve, you can see that we're getting uh, very noticeable increases and uh, tracks and what have you as we're doing that. 
So the plan is to eventually use that as a, uh, as a uh, method for even uh, studying the uh, reaction site density. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we, we a lot of data built up now in this uh, pressure depressurization type device. Incidentally, I forgot to say, uh, the CR39 is also discussed in great detail in a, in a uh, poster by, uh, 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 by our group, and so you can see that. And uh, uh, now uh, what I was going to say is that uh, we, we have a lot of data from this pressurized depressurizing. Uh, what we want to do is move on to higher temperature runs. That was all done at low temperatures. At higher temperatures, we're hoping that we don't have to do pressurization, depressurization. We have some, uh, some data that would suggest that we should be able to eventually get a steady state run without, without requiring that. So we want to move to high temperatures. There's, a, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's also a poster that discusses our design for doing that. Uh, so we can go to that to look at where we're planning. Uh, but the, uh, uh, I, I want to say that if that doesn't really pan out, uh, it's still possible to make some type of uh, prototype uh, device uh, that would uh, be of interest, although it's not as much of an interest because of the poor temperature energy conversion to, say, electricity and so on, but for power, if, you, if we stay where we are and we have slides, I don't have time to go through them, where you can just uh, do what we were saying with a pressurized, depressurizing a series of, of, of vessels here. And if we have proper heat exchanges and so on, you can get a reasonably efficient system for doing that. And uh, so if you take the data that I showed earlier, well, it didn't seem like it was that impressive maybe, but Still, you could work it out so you get a 50 watt system based on having uh, something like uh, uh, 86 uh, grams of nanoparticles per vessel, giving a total of uh, 516. Or if you don't want to put that much into it, we can we can go down to 29 grams per vessel and get uh, get 32 watts out. So. Uh, pressurization, depressurization cycles uh, could produce a device, but it's not quite what we want. So, oops, I went the whole way. <laughs> so, in addition to the, uh, the great uh, support from industrial heat, uh, we, we had some support from NPL Associates Inc. and from Nanico. And, uh, well, I think it's obvious from what I said, uh, <clears throat> all this uh, discussion of calorimetry, uh, excess heat, et cetera, uh, is based on what we've done thus far, and we haven't had anyone replicate that. So it's, uh, it, it's not to be uh, taken, I think, uh, <laughs> until that is done. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. I think we are completely out of time. We have already run 10 minutes into lunchtime, and he has many posters, and his young and enthusiastic students are going to be available. So I encourage you to take up the questions at that time. Thank you, everybody, and thank you once again, George. Okay. We meet again at 1.30 immediately for lunch. Okay. Wonderful. A lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>